Right now, we're experiencing an unprecedented surge towards finally sending humans to Mars. Just in the past month, we've seen updated Mars mission architectures from SpaceX and Lockheed Martin. But during such an information deluge, it's easy to lose track of the bigger picture and of tangible, specific details. So today, we're going to take an in-depth look at SpaceX's updated Mars architecture, contrast it with Lockheed Martin's competing Mars Base Camp architecture, and finally, I'll offer you a quick update on Mars One's current situation. So let's start with a quick summary of Elon Musk's presentation at the 2017 International Astronautical Congress in Australia. At the heart of SpaceX's Mars ambitions is the BFR, or Big Falcon Rocket. This is a fully reusable two-stage rocket consisting of a booster and spaceship capable of delivering a 150-ton payload to low Earth orbit. Now, just like SpaceX's current Falcon 9 vehicle, the first stage separates and returns to Earth, where it can then be prepared to launch again. With the spaceship in orbit, a series of up to five tanker ships then launch, each in turn docking rear to rear before transferring fuel via small thruster acceleration. Once fully fueled, the ship then embarks on a three-month voyage to Mars. Upon arriving, it enters the atmosphere at 7.5 kilometers per second, employing a lifting trajectory to maximize its time in the atmosphere, and hence use drag to burn off 99% of its kinetic energy. During the final 40 seconds, the engines ignite using supersonic retropropulsion to slow the vehicle from over twice the speed of sound to a gentle landing. Whilst on the surface, a propellant production plant combines water from subsurface ice deposits with carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere to synthesize liquid methane and liquid oxygen, the fuel for the ship via electrolysis and the Sabatier process. Once its mission is concluded, the refueled ship can then launch before making a direct return to the Earth. Now let's take a detailed look at the individual components of the BFR. It should also be noted that this is a smaller vehicle than the interplanetary transport system Elon announced last year, and so wherever possible I've provided comparative figures on all of the slides I will show for the old architecture. At 106 meters tall and 9 meters wide, the BFR is around 50% taller and 2.5 times wider than SpaceX's current Falcon 9 rockets. The booster is propelled by 31 Raptor engines, each delivering 1,700 kilonewtons of thrust at sea level. Focusing now on the spaceship, which is sometimes called the BFS or Big Falcon ship, we see a fully reusable vehicle that despite having half the proposed payload capacity of last year's interplanetary transport system, can still carry an impressive 150 tons to Mars. It is separated into three sections, featuring Raptor engines, propellant storage tanks, and the payload at the head. In crew transport configuration, typically two or three people will reside in each of the 40 cabins. This is all made possible by the combination of liquid methane and liquid oxygen that fuels the highly efficient Raptor engines at the rear of the craft. A combination of specialized vacuum engines and sea level engines are used for interplanetary transfers, whilst the sea level engines are used during landing on Mars. I should note though that Elon has recently indicated the intention to add a third sea level engine to avoid having to land on just a single engine in the event of a failure. Over the past year, SpaceX have made some truly impressive strides towards realizing their vision of the BFR. In addition to testing the structural integrity of a carbon fiber cryogenic fuel tank, they have also conducted 42 tests of a scaled demonstration Raptor engine for a cumulative firing time of 1,200 seconds as of early September. One of the advantages of SpaceX reducing the target size of the Raptor engine by 60% since last year is that their current test engine only needs to be scaled up by around 15 to 30% to meet the new design specifications. 
And indeed, SpaceX's president, Gwen Shotwell, recently confirmed that they are building a larger Raptor engine as we speak. So how does SpaceX plan to fund the development of this new vehicle, which would become the highest payload rocket in the world? Now that is where it gets interesting. Because SpaceX plans to progressively shift their resources away from their current lineup of Falcon rockets and Dragon capsules until eventually their current vehicles are entirely phased out. By utilising the lessons from their partly reusable Falcon 9 rockets, SpaceX hopes to pivot fully to the BFR to create an all-in-one system capable effectively of everything that the launch market might desire. One of the proposed applications that certainly caught my eye as an astronomer would be the launch of space telescopes with 9 meter diameter mirrors without any of the complicated and costly unfolding that the 6.4 meter James Webb Space Telescope will have to go through in 2019. And all of this is estimated to cost less than the Falcon 1, which cost only around $9 million per launch. So what comes next then? While well, SpaceX hopes to begin construction of the various components of the first BFR within the next six to nine months, with the full vehicle eventually being assembled at a new facility being built near the water in Los Angeles, there will initially be a series of hop tests, similar to the Grasshopper program that pioneered Falcon 9's reusability, before eventually orbital velocity test flights. If all goes well, then SpaceX aspires to launch two cargo ships to Mars in 2022 to establish basic infrastructure, before launching an additional two cargo ships and two crewed ships in 2024 to set up the propellant plant and basic base architecture. Now, if you've been following SpaceX for some time, I imagine you'll be quite familiar with Elon setting ambitious timelines particularly for the Falcon Heavy, which has slipped so many times from an initial estimated 2013 launch date to now late December 2017, which probably in practice means early next year. But one thing that's worth considering is that I actually asked Elon five years ago when he was giving a talk in Oxford in 2012 what year he thought humans would land on Mars. And at the time, he replied to me, 2024. And so I find it truly fascinating that they are still targeting that year. Personally, I think that these dates will inevitably slip. And the reason is due to the necessity of SpaceX developing two key and new technologies that currently don't exist. The first is the in-situ resource utilization system that is required on Mars to produce propellant. Though Elon has recently confirmed that SpaceX already have a design for this, which is far along in the pipeline. The second, and perhaps most difficult, will be the life support systems for both the BFR spaceship and the Mars base itself. Because these will need to be far more advanced and sophisticated than the systems that are currently used on the International Space Station today. Now, I don't think that the development of either of these are showstoppers, but given how mission critical they are, I won't be surprised if SpaceX decides to err on the side of caution to give themselves more time to thoroughly test the efficacy of these systems. But ultimately, SpaceX has a clear vision to become the transportation company that opens an entire new world to exploration and settlement and the execution of that vision is well underway. I'd now like to turn to compare SpaceX's architecture to that of Lockheed Martin, which has been developing a competing vision more closely aligned with NASA's Mars mission framework. Now, if you're a SpaceX fan, then please don't drop out, because it's really important that multiple Mars mission architectures are on the table, so that ultimately the best possible missions can be designed, utilising ideas from many different possible architectures. Lockheed's proposal is to send a small orbital station to Mars called the Mars Base Camp. It will consist of two habitats and a living space of around 300 cubic metres, 24 fuel storage tanks, two cryogenic propulsion modules, four solar panels and radiators, 
a laboratory, and two of NASA's Orion crew modules. The idea is to initially use the Gateway to support a 1,000-day, six-astronaut crewed mission to Mars, nominally in 2028. During this mission, astronauts would go on excursions to the moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos, to obtain samples that are vital for research in resolving how these moons formed. They would also remotely operate drones and rovers for real-time remote exploration of Mars. But crucially, during this initial one-year mission in Martian orbit, there would be no crewed landings on Mars. The idea would be for a reusable ascent and descent vehicle to be added to the base camp for the following crewed mission. This 100-ton lander would carry four crew members to the Martian surface, employing a lifting trajectory with supersonic retropropulsion, just like SpaceX's BFR, though at a lower entry velocity of 3 to 5 kilometers per second due to not entering from a hyperbolic trajectory. A notable area where the two architectures differ, though, is that Lockheed proposes a liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen-based engine, which has a higher specific impulse of 450 seconds compared to Raptors of around 350 seconds. An interesting application of this choice of fuel is that oxygen and hydrogen boil-off can actually be combusted to generate electricity whilst on the surface. Once landed, there would be on average two surface excursions per Martian sol, each with two crew members, over a roughly two-week period. Following this, the vehicle launches to orbit and returns to the base camp. Now, there are some advantages and disadvantages to Lockheed Martin's architecture. One aspect that I really like is the flexibility afforded by being able to conduct reconnaissance from orbit, decide on a landing location, abort back to orbit at any time, and refuel for another landing attempt. As a scientist, I see distinct benefits of this approach, whereby the mission parameters can be adapted as new results emerge, in particular from analyses conducted in the laboratory, with landing sites not predetermined at launch many months previously. It's also beneficial to be able to abort to Mars orbit without having to go all the way back to Earth in the case of an emergency. But for me, the most striking disadvantage is that this architecture fundamentally seems to care little for the overall cost. Nowhere is this more apparent than when you realise that just transporting the 100 tonnes of water needed to fuel even a single surface landing requires the launch of two dedicated water delivery missions from the Earth, each of which would need to use NASA's Space Launch System rocket. Just from launch cost alone, this would make the cost of each two-week surface mission close to $4 billion, and that's after the base camp is built and after a crew is already in orbit around Mars. Now, I don't want to sound too critical because there are some fascinating aspects of Lockheed's architecture that I really like, in particular the focus on real-time scientific objectives. But in my mind, this concept simply won't be sustainable unless it is unwedded from the expensive, expendable Space Launch System rocket. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Lockheed's Mars Base Camp architecture, in particular if, like me, you are interested in all of the technical specifications and details, they've produced some great studies on the concept, which I'll link to you down in the description. Finally, a quick update on Mars 1. First though, a little bit of background. Mars 1 have spent a total of around $1.5 million over the past five years, which has produced studies with Lockheed Martin on a demonstration lander, in addition to studies with the Paragon Space Development Corporation on the Mars Base Life Support System and on the surface suits, all of which are publicly available and I'll link to them down below. They plan in the next 15 months to spend 11 million euros to dramatically accelerate their progress. 6 million euros of this was agreed in a deal signed late last year with the Hong Kong based World Stock and Bond Trade Limited, with the other 5 million euros coming from an ongoing private placement round. But things have been going much slower than anyone would like. Early this year, 
Mars One received two independent valuations from different auditors, a German and a Swiss auditor, of $389 million and $505 million respectively. But the new shares associated with these valuations could not be immediately listed on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange due to an existing market cap of 25 million euros. And because of this, trading of the stock has been frozen since March of this year, whilst Mars One has been going through the process of handling the necessary administrative work. And until the trading resumes with an increased cap, Mars One simply cannot transfer the shares agreed upon as part of the 6 million euro investment that they signed last year. So right now, Mars One are taking two steps to rectify this situation. Firstly, they are currently writing a prospectus to accompany the new stock, which will shortly be sent to the authorities at the Frankfurt Stock Exchange for approval, which is the final step to get the shares trading again. But Mars One doesn't want to wait that long before they can make progress. So as a second step, they are currently meeting with private investors all around Europe to raise 500,000 euros as part of a private placement round. This money will be used principally to fund the third round of their astronaut selection process, which Mars One is keen to get moving as soon as possible after all the holdups on the financial side over the past two years. In addition, they have recently published a set of financial projections online, link below, which seeks to elaborate on their business case and anticipated revenues, mostly based on extrapolating pre-existing data on visitor numbers to their website each time they've taken a major step forward. I'll of course keep you updated and apprised with any future developments. Okay, so that about wraps up what is almost certainly my longest Mars mission update so far, given the large gap in time since the last one. This is simply put because my research has just been consuming so much of my time as of late that it's been somewhat difficult to scrape together the time to put out an update. But we've had some great results. In fact, just in the last month, some of my research was published in the journal Nature, where we reported the first detection of titanium oxide in an exoplanet atmosphere. It's an exciting and exhilarating time, and there's so much going on with my research, so I, I hope you don't mind the relative infrequency of these updates as of late. I would like to end with a question for you, and it's slightly different than usual. So consider the Mars mission architecture that you most prefer. What I'd like to ask is, what do you think is the biggest challenge that it faces? And how would you modify their plan to make it more effective? And if you do have any other questions for me or comments on this video, or perhaps you're just wondering where my next video is when I inevitably get lost in my science again, then please do drop all of your feedback down below, because I do read all of it, and I will try to reply to as much as possible. But with that, I'll sign off for now, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Last time, I spoke about SpaceX's impressive progress so far this year, and asked for your views on whether the future of space exploration lies in the private or public sectors. The general consensus seemed to be wide-scale support for the private sector, with NASA ideally transitioning to an advisory role. A number of you also raised more nuanced and important points about how NASA itself has actually long relied on private companies, with the problem instead being rooted in old space versus new space company mentalities. By all means, please continue this debate down below, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the latest developments in our journey to settle the Red Planet.